Kicking off the list at number 10, the devil worm. Okay, right off the bat, sounds fun. I mean, his name certainly sounds confident. A worm from the underworld, of course he can survive it all. The guy's literally from hell. The devil worm is a type of nematode. It looks pretty haunting under a microscope, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. The thing that sets this little devil apart from the rest is that it doesn't need oxygen to survive, and it can do so in complete darkness and under the most extreme pressure. But yeah, he can live through it all. This devil worm is the deepest living animal on earth, hence its cool nickname. Coming in at number nine, we have know how to respond to different attacks. Different attacks warrant different responses. If your location is being bombed with non-nuclear missiles, then you need to switch off the electricity and shut off the gas in your house to save it from exploding and catching fire. Also, following a non-nuclear bombing, it is safe to go outside and rescue people. However, during a nuclear attack, things are very different. We've actually made a whole video on how to survive a nuclear attack, which goes into a lot of detail on how you should respond. Again, different aircrafts have different sounds, as do different weapons, it is worth knowing what's coming. Coming in at number 8, we have hide out or get in a fallout bunker. Following the aftermath of the cold war in America, a lot of people had fallout bunkers dug into their gardens. Similarly, during world war 2, people across Europe had small bunkers to hide out in while their city was in an air attack. In case of a third world war, you should know where your nearest shelters are or even consider creating one of your own. Some families had enough supplies in them to survive for years, so it could be an option to simply get underground and try and wait out the war. That said, at some point you will need to come up for air. Coming in at number 7, we have gather food and water supplies. During wartime, economies continue and you will in theory still be able to live a reasonably normal life. That said, it's likely that food will be rationed, unavailable or more expensive than usual. Already having a stock of tinned goods and dry food can be an absolute saviour in wartime, meaning that you know that you will not go hungry for a long time. Having a food stock is also the key to survival in a nuclear attack as you will need to be inside for a week or more. Similarly, you will need lots of bottled water in case the tap supply is contaminated or shut off. You also need lots of vitamins and even ionising tablets. Coming in at number Number 6, we have gather medical supplies. The same goes for medical supplies as it does for food and water supplies. In wartime, it will be harder to get hold of medicines. If you are able to keep an emergency stock of all things you personally need to stay healthy, then this could end up saving your life. Stocking up on plasters or band aids, antibacterial wipes, antibacterial cream, dressings, medical alcohol, and other things along those lines will also help you. I would also recommend stocking up on contact lenses and glasses if you wear them as it would be really awful to not be able to see in wartime. Like Coming in at number 5, we have brush up on your survival skills. If by any chance you find yourself evacuated from your home in wartime, your knowledge of survival skills will be imperative. Learning how to build and start a fire, how to create shelter in all conditions, and how to forage for food and water will help you live in unusual environments. Also knowing what to wear, where to go and what to look out for could save your life. Coming in at number 4, we have stay connected. If there is another world war, our generation is at an advantage to previous generations who've had to live through war because we are more connected than ever. Keep a charged mobile phone for emergencies, listen to radio for announcements, watch television, read the news, look out for what people are saying on Twitter. If there is news on what is happening in the war, you will want to hear it, especially if it's advice for survival, evacuation or even advance warning of an attack. Coming in at number 3, we have know your enemy. It is important that in times of war, civilians do not turn on one another. Knowing your enemy will hopefully create a bigger picture and a greater sense of camaraderie between you and your fellow survivors. The war will likely be between governments and organised groups rather than between civilians, which is very very important to remember. In immediate war times, looters and gangs may emerge, but as best you can, you should keep order and peace with your fellow man. Building on from that, coming into number 2, we have keep calm and carry on. You simply must. The world might be falling apart, but if if you want to survive, you simply cannot. Yes, you need to be alert, but you should not be panicked. If you are to get through this, you need to have a strong mind and a healthy body, which should be your primary focus during wartime. There will be a time for sadness, loss and mourning, but for now, you need to be strong for yourself, for your family and for your country. Coming in at number 1 of our top 10 ways to survive World War 3, we have document your experience. Not only will this be important for your sanity, but it may be helpful in years to come. War diaries and journals etc are of huge importance for historians to know what happened 
happened and how it happened. Not to be morbid, but even if you die, your words will immortalise you. If you don't die, it's likely that the war will be the most emotionally traumatic period of your life and you will want to document that for your future self. I would also be maybe a touch careful on how I documented things though. If you're under enemy rule, you're going to want to keep your documentation very secret. In at number 10, we have consider getting out of the city. Cities are known targets in times of war. The cities of London, Berlin, Warsaw, Nagasaki, Sarajevo, and many more were devastated in parts as a result of World War II. Cities have always been targets, and in World War III, wherever it may strike and whomever it may involve, cities will be dangerous places. However, it is important to realise that they also have their benefits, such as more readily available food and medical supplies. Coming in at number 9, we have the canoe trip. Back in August of this year, a mother and her child went on a little canoe trip in northern Saskatchewan. And they certainly weren't prepared for what was going to happen to them. That afternoon, the current was so strong that they were swept away and ended up at an unoccupied island. The wind was so strong that no matter what they did, they couldn't gain control of their canoe. They were stuck on the island for just a day before they were rescued. In our eighth spot, we have HELP. P. Back in 2016, three men were deserted on a remote island near Micronesia after their boat capsized in the South Pacific Island. The three men originally had plans for a short sailing trip, but the weather became brutal and tipped over their boat. And it was at night when this happened, so they swam two miles in the dark until they reached land. From there, they used palm leaves to spell out the word help on the island sand. Thankfully, the men were only stranded for three days before a US Navy plane spotted their fire and then their sign and came to their rescue. In our seventh spot, we have Philip Ashton. In June of 1722, fisherman Philip Ashton joined a crew who planned to sail the waters of Nova Scotia. But while at sea, the crew was captured by pirates, and Philip was held as their captive. For nine months, Philip was stuck being the pirate's prisoner. But all of that changed in March of 1723. That's when they docked on shore, and Philip made a run for it. The pirates searched for him. Him briefly before giving up and getting back on the boat. Philip was then left stranded on the island all alone with no tools or food. But he managed to make a little shelter and ate fruit and turtle eggs to survive. 16 months later, a British ship rescued Philip, and he lived to tell the tale, and even wrote a book about it. Coming in at number 6, we have The Friends. Back in 2012, friends Jesse Brillen and Brian and Dave Marty Nuke were out boating when the strong winds and rough waters caused their boat to capsize. They managed to pull the inflatable raft from the boat and spent 15 hours drifting hopelessly. Eventually, they drifted close to land, where they were stranded for 10 days. They used driftwood to build a shelter and ate sea urchins, seaweed, and clam beds for food. On the 10th day, a sailboat spotted the trio's pile of garbage on shore before seeing the men and rescuing them. We are now at our 5th and halfway mark with the SOS. A couple of months ago in August, three sailors got stranded on an island after attempting to make a 23 nautical mile journey. However, they ended up getting lost and their boat ran out of fuel. They were stranded on this island for three days before being rescued by the Australian and US authorities. During these three days, they managed to make a small shelter and a large SOS sign out of debris. On the third day, this sign was spotted by a passing aircraft, and that was the reason why they were found. Moving on to number four, we have the river monsters. This next man got found by sheer accident. He's actually quite lucky. So in 2016, a fisherman was out sailing when he decided to leave his boat to go to try and find better oysters. But on his journey back, he got sunstroke and couldn't go any further. As a result, he had to spend the night on the beach. The next morning, he tried to travel back some more, but again, the heat and sun were too much for him. By then, his boat was gone and he was stuck on the island. But lucky for him, a TV series called River Monster arrived on the island as they were using it as their filming location. That's when they came across the fisherman who ran out of the cave to the crew naked, flailing his arms all about. The crew 
literally saved his life. Now, this man is so lucky because the crew weren't even supposed to film at this island in the first place. They were planning on using a different island, but changed locations last minute due to choppy waters. Little did they know that by doing this would save a man's life. In our third spot, we have Ada Blackjack. In 1921, Ada Blackjack struggled to take care of her son who was suffering from tuberculosis. In order to make more money for her son's treatments, Ada joined a team of explorers as a cook and seamstress. But the journey didn't go as planned. Quickly, they were out of food and had to go hunt to obtain more. Ada was left to care for a crewman, Lorne Knight, who was suffering from scurvy, while the others went to go look for more food. They never returned for Ada or Lorne. From there, she had to learn how to survive. She would trap and kill wild animals for her and Lorne. Sadly, Lorne passed away, but Ada managed to survive for two years alone. On August 19, 1923, Ada was rescued by one of the men that left her there in the first place. Like, the nerve that dude had to come back after all those years. I would have been pissed. Like, yes, I'm here, I'm still alive, thank you for leaving me. In our second spot, we have the castaways. Now, this story is a bit different different than the rest of the ones on the list. In this case, the two wanted to be left on a deserted island. So back in 1980, a British writer put an ad in Time Out magazine saying that he wanted a female to live with him on a deserted island. I don't know about you, but I would be a little sketched out by that ad. But one lady, Lucy Irvine, was intrigued by it. And so the two set out to Toon Island. Now, she was only 24 years old, but the British writer was 49. Now, he didn't plan this through enough because there wasn't enough fresh water to sustain them and hardly any vegetation on this island. The two survived on the island for about a year when they were saved by some islanders. If it wasn't for them, they wouldn't have survived because they were running out of the necessities. Story goes that Lucy was the one keeping them both alive. But the other dude on the other hand had given up faith a number of times. He didn't think they were gonna make it. And in our number one spot, we have Alexander Selkirk. Alexander Selkirk was a Scottish man who is famous for surviving on an island for four years. So on October of 1704, Selkirk was a part of a crew sailing around Cape Horn. But the crew started to become very sick. Many were dying of disease and their food supply was diminishing. Plus the food that they did have was all infested with worms. And the ship was in rough shape. So he told the captain they should just abandon the ship and wait for help. The captain was not too fond of this idea. And so Alexander got off the ship and waited around on a deserted island thinking that another ship would be along shortly. Well, shortly was four years and four months later. All he was left with was some clothing, a musket, some tools, a bible, and tobacco. To survive, he found fresh water, ate goats and seals and plums, and he even tamed a wild cat to keep him company and to keep the vermin away from him while he slept. Starting off this countdown, we have the Johnson family. It's hard enough being stuck in quarantine with your family. I can't imagine how it would be stuck on a deserted island with them. In the early 90s, the Johnson family headed out sailing on their family boat. However, the family of four encountered some rough waters which resulted in their boat tipping over. Unable to save their small boat, they watched it sink right before their eyes as they bobbed up and down in the freezing cold waters. The family ended up making it to a nearby island and survived there for nearly 40 days. They would collect rain droplets for drinking and caught turtles and fish as their food source. Thankfully, they were rescued by a local fisher who saw them on the island. That's uh, definitely one method of family bonding. Number nine. Ants. There's thousands of species of ants. We've talked about the bullet ant here before and how their bites feel like a literal bullet wound. Their sting is considered the most powerful in the world and its effects can last 24 hours. That alone is scary. That's a scary ant right there. But these guys come in all different shapes and sizes. The feature that allows them to survive for so long is, well, one, of course, they can live deep in the ground, but they also sacrifice each other. Yeah, did you know this about ants? This was not an ant man. I missed this part. If one ant is sick or injured, they'll all decide as a group that it's that ant's time to go. And then they'll all be like, and throw it off something. Yeah, in order to ensure the safety of the rest of the colony, they sacrifice one sick ant. How wild is that? They've been around for a very long time and there's no reason to believe that an apocalypse can hold them back. They're gonna live through it all. Number eight, blue whales. 
The largest animal to ever live on Earth, coming in at 330,000 pounds, give or take. The blue whale is hard to miss, but even so, scientists have found it incredibly difficult to describe their sex life. Yeah, that's a mystery to us still. We still want to know what's going on down there. The reproduction is a mystery, and it doesn't help that blue whales often will travel alone. But come late July, early August, they begin to pair up. They have to spend time with one another first, unlike, you know, other animals that get freaky on the spot in the wild. Richard Sears, a marine researcher, says that they'll travel for weeks with mating not being a foregone conclusion. Yeah, just a really long first date. We still have no idea how females choose a mate. Sometimes another male will join in and they'll almost race each other in the water and then fight over this female. It's pretty cool. It's like some Fast and Furious type stuff. There's another theory that blue whale vocalizations have some sort of reproductive function. Yeah, you gotta spit that game, my friends. Better practice your hums and or hums. <laughs> I wrote that, I'm so stupid. Bowhead whales are the longest living animal on Earth. They live around 200 years. This massive beast, yeah, it's not going anywhere anytime soon, no matter what happens here on land. Number seven, tardigrades. It's not every day you discover an entirely new species in a parking lot, but back in 2018, a new type of tardigrade was found. AKA the water bear, these microscopic tardigrades can be found in moss and soil. And this new species was found near somebody's apartment building in Japan, so you really never know. Could be anywhere. Could be one under your keyboard right now. To the naked eye, these things well, they don't exist. They're tiny little creatures, but up close, through a microscope, they're horrifying. Yeah, they're caterpillar looking creatures with three rows of teeth. They look like the sandworms from Dune. The new Dune, too. The, the scarier looking ones with the nice CGI, the scary CGI. I can't tell if them being extremely small is better for us or worse. Out of sight, out of mind. I'm good. Number six, jellyfish. These jellyfish are the largest of all sea jellies. They grow up to around 76 centimeters in diameter. They have four to seven arms. I say arms literally like thick fleshy arms. Rather than the tentacles that we're used to seeing on jellies, these things are pretty thick. Most jellies are transparent as well. These guys, they're just red all over. Because of their deep sea habitat, there's still so much we don't know about them. We've only ever identified 23 out in the wild. So, so it's still a complete mystery to us. While the research is currently lacking, scientists are doing their best to get some more answers on these big red jellies. The crew at Ambari, they bring us the most alien footage ever. This stuff is fascinating. No way jellyfish are going anywhere. Look at these guys. Underwater, yeah. Aliens, also yes. These guys are crazy. Jellyfish, ugh, I got stung by one. And yep, if you're thinking about it, I did. And I tried it. And it worked. Number five, cockroaches. These little guys are the worst of the worst. Oh, I hate this. I was, I don't want to talk about it. Now I'm Goosebumps. They can survive anything, and yeah, that includes the literal apocalypse, however that may look. There are over 4,000 species of cockroaches. They can withstand high levels of radiation, and they're on track to outlast all of our insecticides and obviously us. When these creepy crawlies are exposed to toxins, they quickly evolve right there in front of our very eyes. We're literally making them stronger the more we spray at them. Although cockroaches will live two years at most, females give birth to around 300 offspring. Yep, there's the goosebumps I just got. That's horrible, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. I'm not a fan of bugs, and you know what? I'm not gonna lie on this list, it gets worse before it gets better. Number four. Mummichog. Sounds like a Doctor Strange villain, doesn't it? What the hell is this all about? The Mummichog is also referred to as the Achilla fish or mud minnow. And lucky for us, this little guy has the ability to survive in highly polluted areas. We're not doing anything to help. Around 8,000 times more than the lethal dose of toxins in a natural environment, this guy can just swim around and breathe in. So the more we pollute our oceans, the stronger he gets. Do we want that? I don't think we want that. Let's stop polluting, because this thing will get bigger. They genetically mutate, so anytime they run into anything toxic, they can turn off chemical pathways inside of them to survive. Yeah, they can evolve on the spot. Number three, scorpions. I always say I'm afraid of spiders here on this channel, and I very much am, but I've been sleeping on scorpions. They're a horrible combination of everything bad, honestly. Scorpions can survive in deserts. They can survive in rainforests, and some even survive in mountains. I mean, I don't want to alarm anybody out here, but they're kind of everywhere, all over the earth. What might be under your bed right now as you watch this on your phone? Hopefully like this. If you're watching like this, shame on you. Sometimes you'll find a scorpion frozen outside. I say sometimes. If you're a scientist, you'll find a scorpion frozen outside. It's immobile. It's otherwise dead, but as time passed on, researchers would watch these frozen scorpions come back to life. So yeah, even if they're gone and frozen and otherwise dead, they'll come back. They slow their metabolism rate enough, so if need be, they can live off of one insect per year. That's it. This guy's fasting. He's killing it. Yeah, you didn't know that, eh? Now you're, now you're sweating like me. Welcome. Welcome to MA. Hit that thumbs up because we're all sweating now. Number two, immortal jellyfish. More jellyfish. Why, of course, let's talk about them. Creatures like the immortal jellyfish could be the key to advancing human life. Honestly, it's pretty impressive. Some people want Spider-Man abilities. I would take immortality any day. I even say it with respect. Immortality. <laughs> I take my time with it. It was said over 4,000 years ago to Gilgamesh that the secret to immortality lie in coral on the ocean floor. And in 1988, German marine biologist Christian Sommer, apparently he found it. He discovered Turritopsis Dorney, aka the immortal jellyfish. This is the Benjamin Button of the sea. He was studying this 
creature and before his very eyes, it literally started to age backwards. It started to reverse the life cycle right in front of him. So they started off in their larval form. They mature into polyps, which bud off into these tiny, beautiful jellyfish. The life cycle, we love it. So far we're on board. And one species of jellyfish, this one somehow changed that life cycle. Although it's smaller than your average fingernail, when it gets hurt or begins to starve, instead of dying, it just shrinks itself even more. It reabsorbs its tentacles and then having now lost the ability to move, it sinks back down to the sea floor and then begins as a blob all over again. It just keeps repeating the life cycle. That's insane. Apocalypse or not, this little guy is going back in time regardless. Like he's good. He's more than good. Finally, number one, Mars bacteria. Yep, you heard me. We gotta finish on a crazy one. It's only fair. Or else, why am I here? The Perseverance rover is currently searching on Mars for well, anything. In 2002, Russian astrobiologist hypothesized that bacteria here on Earth may have actually evolved up there on Mars. Dinococcus radiodurans is the most mighty bacteria on Earth, and apparently it started somewhere else. It can live through cold, dehydration, space, acid, radiation proof. This thing's got it all. These little microbes can withstand several thousand times the amount of radiation that a human can withstand, as well as more radiation than any other bacteria here on Earth. You can even find this bacteria on the inside of a nuclear reactor. That's how strong he is. He's like, yeah, this is where I live. What about you? We're like, no, we close cities because of you, my guy. Since Earth just doesn't carry around, you know, that much radiation, some scientists speculate that Mars is virtually unprotected and receives extremely high amounts of radiation. Therefore, these bacteria may have evolved up there, got stronger and stronger, and then gained their resistance in just, you know, a few hundred thousand years or whatever. And they may have accidentally been flung off of Mars by an asteroid. And then they were brought here to Earth by meteorites. It's like the ultimate space Uber. This is like a Spider-Man villain in the making. This is crazy, I feel it.